Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dino Watt, and excited to have you listening in again and hopefully taking notes, uh, using your time wisely to learn all the best practices that you can do for your practice. And today we have a really cool guest on because I love talking about trust and leadership when it comes to your organization. As you know, many of you listening know that I almost will always even circle back to, okay, well, how does that help you be a better leader, right? And today we have an expert in that field. We have Carrie Smith on. Before we get to Carrie, we just want to remind everybody that if you get any value out of this podcast, and hopefully if you're listening, you do, you will uh, please subscribe to it and then also let your friends and colleagues know about it so that they also can uh, learn the best practices for their practice and elevate the industry as a whole. So that being said, thank you so much, Carrie, for being on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. This This is cool. Wow, I'm excited uh, to have you and to listen to you. I first always would love to have you just introduce yourself to everybody. I often find when I'm on podcasts and people, you know, they read my bio, I'm like, I'm right here. I can probably do a better job than, than you can. So uh, please let, let us know a little bit about you, where you came from, how you got started in this industry and all the fun, fun sexy stuff. Yeah, sure. Well, I don't know if it's sexy or not, but I'll try to make it that way. The, uh, 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 my, I'm originally from Austin, Texas, born there. Uh, kind of a unicorn in that world, uh, being born from there. Uh, the uh, went to University of Texas. I was a pre-med major there. Did a bunch of studies on pre-med and then naturally uh, did get accepted to medical school, but then pursued a career in HR and human resources. So I did that for a number of uh, different companies, Motorola, Cigna Healthcare, um, the Hartford Insurance Company, and I uh, just uh, had 11 years of HR experience, but then wanted to, I guess I had got bored of that, went into a new career, and I started doing uh, advisory, risk management advisory and insurance for for doctors. Uh, my brother's an oral surgeon in Austin, and uh, not that that uniquely qualifies me for anything, but just growing up with a guy and going to dental <laughs> school and hanging out with Hanging out with Dennis just gave me give me a perspective that you know dentistry uh, the people that do dentistry are they're they're in, in, in nothing special I mean they're not splitting atoms with you know MIT degrees and not that that's uniquely special but they're just regular people yeah. that are pursuing their passion and I I'm I'm really drawn to that I mean that's something that is so core my family's all my forefathers were entrepreneurs and owned their own businesses and mm. struggled through the, deliver, the delivery of their skill as a way of survival. And I think that's why, why I work with uh, dentists and dental specialists. And that's what brought me today. And that's what, um, you know, really crafted everything we're about. Well, it's interesting because you, you do have a unique perspective uh, on a couple of, of, of levels, obviously having gone to dental school, uh, understanding that every, everybody knows this is not a secret, but understanding obviously they don't get any training at all on how to actually be an entrepreneur. There's no HR classes there, you know, that type of thing. How do you, how do you deal with people? Like how do you deal with personalities? Mm -hmm. And you have uh, that uniqueness of going to the school, but also having the entrepreneur side to you. I'm really curious. And when you're going through dental school, how did you make that turn into going, you know what, I want to really dive into the HR side of things, the human resource side of thing. And I, I use human resources in a couple of different ways in my trainings, not just like how to hire and fire people, but really how to, how to connect with people, how to build the right team, because that's, I, I believe, a big part of HR. How did you make that turn? Yeah. So, well, just to be clear, I'm not a dentist and I didn't do, go to dental school. I went to the dental school mostly to drink beer with my brother while he was <laughs> in dental school. <laughs> yeah. I know you're not a dentist, but why you were there, did you actually go through school though? No, no, no. I, uh, it was uh, actually, wasn't even dentistry. It was osteopathic medicine was, oh, my goodness. That I got chose. but, uh, but uh, you know, relevant, relevant experience wise, like having gone to the dental schools and sure. with the students and talking about things that we worry about, like risk management, which is mostly, uh, uh, mostly the, the 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 genre of things we discuss. The 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 analogy I can draw is, you know, when when they're in dental school, I tell them the students all the time, you know, you have to study entrepreneurship as much as you study dentistry, because the the ultimate the ultimate fate that. for you is you will be depending upon yourself to craft a living and execute with a high level of degree and influencing people's lives, not only clinically but also from a uh, leadership and relationship perspective. We had a, we had a doctor call us once talking to my wife. She was doing some uh, pre-screening for me and 
my wife had made the point, just like, we understand that, you know, um, not all doctors have, have uh, understand how to be uh, do- uh, leaders in their business, owners of businesses. Mm-hmm. And the doctor stopped her and she goes, no, you don't understand. I've never even held a job before. Like I just went through school and <laughs> I, I never even have worked for anybody before. So I don't know not how just to be a leader. I don't know how to be an employee. Yeah. And that's so, a skill set you have to learn. It, it's, you know, that's, uh, so, so to answer your question, why did we pivot this direction? Yeah, yeah. Because, because risk, it, the risk dentist face. So we, in Dentist Secure, one of my companies, Dentist Secure, we do, we do insurance for dentists. We advise them on all the insurance they need for their business. And malpractice is a big component of that. And that policy itself is designed to defend your reputation ultimately. And what we're found is when, when, when students come out of school and new dentists get working, even older dentists, I mean, there's no age, age limit here on when people can get sued, but it just comes down to, did we have the skill to handle the situation and were we aware of it? Or are we depending on our insurance policies to bail us out? Mm. And that is, that's what we, what we specifically worry about is the educational component that helps lift the doctor up. So they're not depending on these third parties that, you know, like an insurance policy should be your, your course of last resort when you have a relationship issue with your patient. Right. That's the, but, but, but that a lot of times for many dentists, almost all of them and specialists alike, uh, that is the only protection they've been offered by providers is like, Hey, we're the best malpractice insurance company, but that's all we're ever going to do for you. That in my, that in my estimation is a failure of that product to, to really affect change for the doctor. And that's why I'm on front of this microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do. it's intriguing to me because uh, I actually was just having a conversation last weekend. I was at a speaking event with some other uh, dental speakers and this conversation came up about, well, it came up in the sense of um, not just healthcare insurance, not just malpractice insurance, but this particular person was telling me a story about, um, uh, was it injury, not injury insurance. I'm it's slipping my brain. Um, you know, when you're injured and you need help, uh, insurance for, uh, per, like personal injury or disability, personal, personal injury, disability. Per, personal injury and disability. There you go. Yep. Uh, and I brought up a story about a dentist, doc, a client of mine who was out with his family, ATV, having a good time, hit a bump, went over the handlebars, broke both of his hands. It's like that. that that's, that's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Are, I, I'm the guy, we are the people that we get called when those things happen. It could be mm. the, could be the car through the front door, could be the employee slipped and fell in the parking lot and broke their hip, could be the uh, patient aspirated a foreign object, could be the practice just burned down last night, could be all these things, right? And right. The, the, those are the end, that's the end of the road for risk. Sure. There's the, everything before that, that came before that is what we're trying to affect. And that's what you, ultimately what you're trying to affect too is, is the, the, the negative outcome has causality and the causality can be influenced and there's ways to influence it. And those are the risk management techniques that uh, we like to bring, to bring to bear. Well, let's talk about a few of those then. Let's talk about some of the big gaping holes that you typically see and, and, and try to warn. And, and I would love to also hear some of the excuses that you've heard before of why not to. Uh, besides money, because yeah. that's always going to be the first one. Right? Well, yeah, money. you know, I mean, when all, all things being equal, people just kind of boil it down to cost. Like, well, how much does this cost? And it's like, well, you know, the cost calculation in a, in a global sense is very different than just, sure, uh, you know, what this thing tangibly costs. But I think if we start at the very beginning, the top of the, the top of the molehill is, is when, like, we work with a lot of DSOs. We have a lot of large groups that work with us. And when we first meet them, it's always cost because that's all they've been sold. I mean, like Jake with State Farm, right? They've got this marketing push to them all the time about transaction and we're sure. billions of dollars of marketing going out about, about this cost thing. But when I talk to an owner of a dental practice, I say the, the one thing you need to not be is a good dentist. That's the first thing you shouldn't be is a good dentist. There's two priorities you should have as a dental practice owner. And one of the, you've already learned the clinical piece. You should already be good, but that shouldn't be your focus. It should be developing people and managing risk. Those are the two things as a business owner that mm. you should focus on. And if you get those two things right, you're, you've got it made. Your talent is perfect. You're developing your people to take over the workloads and oversee the practice and have ownership and engagement. And then the risk management piece is you're identifying techniques to keep risk from being in your practice and there's value in that. And so I'm going to invest in those strategies versus 
well, how much does your OSHA training course cost? I was like, well, sure. how much does an OSHA penalty cost? 7,000 bucks <laughs> or whatever, right? So, All right. Um, you know, those are the, the, when you talk about cost and things, you, you, we really try to look at, and I, I think this was in your book, it's like, or, or something similar was with right dentist. You got to have the right dentist wanting to do this. And that's the key thing is getting the dentist to think about this as a leadership and a risk management issue. Okay. So with that, um, are there like some major risk areas that you see people kind of overlooking when they're looking at their, their structure of their business or who they're hiring or in any, any way, shape or form? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, there's <laughs> the big gaping holes are going to be uh, ignorance. I think that's the first one. And I, I like that word because it's a little bit shocking. I mean, who, why'd you yeah. call me ignorant? Sure. But the thing is, is, you just can't know everything. And we have information overload and the right messages, even though they're maybe well-crafted, can't get through. So doctors that are owning these practices and running these businesses, there's just no capacity and men mental capacity to take anything else on. That's the big risk is being so busy, you can't focus on being a leader and rent managing risk in your business. That's the big gaping hole. Then the second right behind it is probably right up your alley is, is that the talent we hire in our business you know, we, we hire people to run million dollar businesses, but they're not Kellogg School of Business MBA people, right? They're, they've been elevated from within the profession and where did they get their 100%. education? Yep. That's a risk. And, yeah. you know, even though those, some of these people are, are I, I've met a ton of people that are awesome. I love yes. them death, their friend. Yep. Global, global perspective, having the courage and, and educational background to say, doc, if you want to go to seven locations, let's not multiply complexity seven times. Let's multiply it once and then do it seven times. So we have it nailed. And a lot of times people are just always looking backwards and depending on the reactivity of their business versus being um, thinking about like, you know, what's over the horizon and making plans today. It's very reactive. It seems, I mean, that's, major yeah, problem. it's, it's, it, it makes me think of uh, a buddy of mine talks about financial planning and he said his question to clients is, are, is your CPA, your accountant, your financial planner, are they uh, financial historians or are they looking to the future? <laughs> that's great librarians <laughs> yeah right and it's like wow you, when you're talking about risk are you just looking at well you know we we got through it okay i love your point about you know typically the the people that are running their business very rarely do i come up against and every i, I do every once in a while but very rarely do i come up against somebody who's and this is no knock to office managers or business managers but very rarely are they hiring somebody who has actually not just the practice, having worked in a practice experience, but also the business-wise experience, maybe the education behind it. Understanding the real inner workings of how to grow a brand and a practice, usually it is, like you said, it was that person. And, and it's a beautiful story when you hear the person saying, hey, I was once just the, you know, the, I, I, I answered the phones. I was the, I was a scheduling coordinator just 10 years ago, and now I'm the office manager. That's awesome. That's a beautiful story. And? If you want to grow that company, what risk are you inherently um, just uh, snowballing because you're not actually going through the right processes and finding people who understands how to look in the cracks the way that you do? Uh, you know, and it's not even, it's like latent, latent risk and deferred risk management, right? I mean, it's just sitting there waiting to be addressed. Either you address it now or you, you address it when, when, when it pops, right? I just, you know, I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking of an office over in Houston. They've got, I think, seven locations now. And the young woman who is the office manager, the operations manager, I go, where'd you come from? And it's the story, right? I mean, I started yeah. the first location. I was mo the most responsible person of the crew. So doc just took me along this journey. And yet emergency preparedness standards aren't there. Like nothing is there. But what those what I see that role kind of being is the firefighter. Like if something pops up, I'm going to address it for the doctor and handle it, but they can't get out of that reactive kind of firefighting state and being strategic. But that's the, um, uh, that's, you know, that's the, when we talk about uh, uh, trust, it's does the doctor trust their business as the, a relationship they have with themselves and their own business? Do they trust that? And then that feeds into, does the doctor trust the people that work there and do they trust the doctor and is there that level of trust? And then the third party in that equation is the patient. Are we, can we, does the patient trust us through our relationship with them? 
and when you when you talk about development risk management and building trust i mean these are very high level things and they get down to like okay what are we what do we need to do today to start cracking this thing right yeah and and then then you go down rabbit holes <laughs> there's like a thousand of them right so where do you start where would you start if that was if that was the thing someone said hey i want to have have this uh have this this journey go like what would you recommend on my end, I probably, what keeps coming up to me is the employee risk factor. That to me is probably, and maybe it's just because I've seen so much of it and maybe it's because we're just having this conversation. You've really lit up something in my brain about going, man, maybe I need to talk to all my doctors about when they get to a certain level, they really need to think about hiring an outside person, MBA person or something like that. And, and I do that also because I have a couple of doctors who've done that wisely and their business has grown. Um, and get a, and and be okay with saying to the person, hey, thank you for growing with me, but I can't have you run my multi-million dollar business now if I want to go to multiple millions of dollars. Um, so probably the employee side of things is where I think I would look first. I feel like yeah, I'm that's... I feel like I'm almost uh, at, on a pop quiz test right now. I hope I got yeah, it right. I don't. You know, there that that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing about it. For for a doctor that's standing in the fire, they have no answers, right? Yeah, it's tough, it's tough to gain the clarity that I, to get that mm -hmm. answer, and so what happens is you do nothing, right? So true, and, and it doesn't get doesn't get addressed. And my, uh, uh, it, you know, for even me, like the, over the holidays, you know, I grew a beard and uh, you know, kind of went out to the ranch and talked to the cows for literally two weeks, and came to the conclusion that the biggest problem in my business, so I own I own four different businesses that manage risk in different ways for doctors. The biggest problem is me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm in the way, I'm yep. in the way and we, and talent is going to take us to the next level. So the, um, you, you know, the, the, that really started, well, we hired some people, you know, I said, went and got some MBA students and that just graduated and said, Hey, here's the challenge. Do you want it? And they took it and we're starting to teach them and, and get them going. And so the future, the future for entrepreneurs is, uh, uh, you know, to get out of the fire for a second and, uh, and, and start developing trust with your business. And that will feed into uh, the people aspect of your practice, which then ultimately vicariously or even on purpose or directly manages. manages risk. Well, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of story and experience and case studies. So let's talk about a few pretty in, uh, interesting, I'm sure you have a dozens, but pick out a few uh, real world examples you can give us about somebody who maybe uh, was doing nothing and you were able to just shine the light on a few things and it transformed the way that they approached their business. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we'll talk to Dr. Max Kerr. I'll drop his name on here. He's a Vista Ridge uh, family dentistry in Cedar Park, Texas. What's up, Max? He is a, uh, has become a good friend. And before we met, um, his business was the way it is. And uh, when we got to talking, he called me, the, the start, start of the relationship was, hey, Carrie, I, what are all these documents I need to collect for uh, like state employment, like HR stuff? And I said, you don't know what that is? And you have a six op, $3 million practice, <laughs> you know, uh, and he's like, all these people. He's like, dude, I'm managing all these people. I can't handle it. You know, yeah, so uh, true. that led us to develop our software platform, Dundesk, which helps to, these doctors manage this. And I said, hey, look, I'm willing to go spend a bunch of money to develop software to help you. Is this a good thing? And he's like, it's, we're, we'll do it. And then um, I attended one of his office manager meetings and he, he and it, this is what's interesting about Max was he enlightened me as much as like, like maybe I have enlightened him. He did a staff meeting where he took the time to ask everybody to love each other through like, recognizing each other and something they did last week that um, really made them feel good. And so it's, he supported the team effort and nice. I was like, man, that's pretty cool. Why do you do that? And he goes, well, because I need them all to play good to execute for our customers and we're not, we're all one team. We're not divided in, we're divided in roles, but we're not divided in effort and what right. we're trying to accomplish. And so that led us down me. I've done now four years. I've done compliance training. I've audited his practices and helped him with that, got that out of the way. And then um, he brought on a business partner. We worked with him and the, the, the Max, the, the, the relationship has just flourished from there because we kept talking about the challenge of entrepreneurship and I'm facing certain challenges. He's facing certain challenges. They end up being the same damn things. I know, right? It's weird. Even though we're not, not I don't get my hands wet at all, right? Uh -huh. They're the same stupid things. And so we, we, 
we, we got so to true. talking and uh, we got to talking and we developed this little program and, and did some training classes for some people. And the dude who does a waste management company in New England finds it. And he's like, or maybe it was Oregon or someone on the West Coast. He's like, wow, this is great. I have the same problems. I'm like, trash yep. guy? Trash guy has the same problems? And, and yep. it seems to occur it seems to occur when you have the, the two things you need to be really good at and it's a technical competent, competent person. And then you're also needing to be technically competent in managing a business. Right. Yep. So, so the stories, the stories we have are more, uh, they're kind of more gradual where they call us and let's say they need insurance and like, ah, I've gotten quotes from all these other different people. And I'm like, okay, well, this is how we think about things. And they're like, Whoa, wait a minute. That's pretty cool. That's how I, that's kind of how I think about treatment planning. And how I, my relationship out with my customers, what do you mean this isn't just a transaction? There's something more here. Then it starts, to, it starts to evolve. And, and the result ends up being like we keep 97, 98% of our customers every year and they tap into our expertise. And, and you know, that's the, that's the, there's a number of stories like that. I mean, it just comes down to just delivery and helping these doctors so they don't have to worry so much. Well, a couple of things that unravel of that, which I think is great, is I had a mentor years ago who said, every business owner has the exact same problems just at different times. And it rings so true. Yeah. I have problems in my business that I can, that's why when I'm talking with docs or, or even other business owners, we, I can relate to that. If I can't relate to putting my fingers in people's mouths and twisting wires and whatever dentistry thing, I can at least relate strongly and I think even more and more so with the entrepreneur side of things. And that's been really great. Um, but what's interesting to me is you mentioned like the, almost like a, a pre, um, preemptive strike on what's going on. I, I know people come to you. I'm sure they do where there's the disaster happening, right? Where it's like, Hey, this just happened. My place just got flooded. You know, what do I do? Yep. But Every, I'm just trying to think, especially in the medical world, like every doctor professional out there, they're trying to be preemptive. They're trying to be proactive and help you be proactive about things you do. Unfortunately, we, as I think human beings often go to the, oh, I'm going to be reactive instead, as a, instead of proactive. But that's exactly what it sounds like you're trying to help them just open their eyes to is the proactive side of things. Yeah. So there's a, there's a methodology we've, I mean, it's not, uh, I don't know if it's a methodology even there's like seven slides I have in a, in a lecture I do on emergency preparedness. Like why do we need emergency preparedness? Cause the emergencies mm -hmm. never happen. So why should we be prepared for nothing that ever happens? Well, you need to be. And yep. there's a sequence of things that need to happen. And one of those is having the right dentist. I mean, having the right methodology and mindset. That's the second piece is right mindset. And then having the right people and the right training and the right endurance and things that, you know, you build it into your business and it can't ever be extra to the business. It's part of, you know, orthodontics or, or, That's or, right. or whatever. It's, it's, it's latent in the business. But the difference is though, is that oftentimes consultants will just talk about key performance indicators, right? Yes. And the doctors say, these are the most important things. And, and private equity wants us to do these sorts of things. And, but they're not saying, you know, how much is, how much is, how good of a uh, relationship do I have with my people or are my talent good? Right. Or do, do yeah. I have time to debt to talk to them and understand them individually if I can versus just come in do my morning huddle then off to the races till Friday afternoon and then we're, we're rinsing and repeating. So the building, yep. building, building the want and, and to into that practice and, and having that is, is kind of the first step I think is just realizing I'm probably not doing everything in here that I need to be doing but so now I need to do something and the something is someone. That's what's mm -hmm. cool is you can lift someone up in your team and say, okay, you, you're responsible for this segment. Yep. You're responsible for this segment. And then if they don't know what to do, then they can be trained. And so you build, you build a, uh, you build redundancy into your business as far as expertise goes. And that's, that's what I would say. You're, you're, if you're interested in this stuff from a, from a dentist owner perspective in 2020, if you don't have individual people that are competent in different aspects of things like, I mean, just watching your practice for infection control and employee safety and 
having a patient advocate. I mean, someone that's skilled in handling patient concerns versus the front desk person who just makes a bunch of phone calls and verifies benefits, right? Their their mind isn't in the right spot, right? For handling a patient objection. But having people that are skilled and trained in those areas as part of a development plan will help you scale your mind so you can spend more time focusing on the patients and, and your people in other ways. So Dan Sullivan, uh, the, he's the creator of uh, the, uh, the strategic coach. He has a quote that is uh, who, not how is what you got to think about in your business. Matter of fact, he's writing a book right now with uh, uh, Ben Hardy who wrote um, Will, willpower doesn't work. And his whole premise is, man, you're not going to succeed unless you figure out the who can do it for you, not the how do you get it, how do you do it? Because you are you don't know all of these things. And so to build that team that has all that, to have that risk management person who is on your team, the point you know man on your team, uh, like you said, the, the consultant advocate, uh, the patient advocate, I think that's critical. Um, I would still love, I, I want to know really, I, I, hopefully people are listening going, when is he going to get to that back, back to that again? What are some excuses that people use? Because I, I, I know there's got to be situations where you're like, hey, here, let me shine the big flashlight on these big problems here. And they go, yeah, yeah, no, I see it. Yeah, totally. I agree. But yeah. And what, what comes after the but? Yeah. So the, the, big, the big one that's happened lately that's uh, pretty interesting is that I think doctors all in all do want to do want to know more about risk management. And we, and, and we, do, we do a series of courses that teach doctors on this stuff and give them CE and whatnot. But, and they seem generally open to that. And, and uh, you know, obviously scheduling and timing is a hard, hard thing to deal with with families and whatnot to get the time out to do that. The, 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 the big one is like, for example, compliance training. Let's just put that out there because they need that all the time and it's something part of their business they do every year. Um, you know, it, it comes down to, like, well, here is the path of least resistance. It's a CD-ROM. Mm. Like even if someone says CD-ROM, I kind of turn CD on CD-ROM? Yeah, they're like, oh, well, we've got a CD-ROM that we make everybody watch, right? Or, or you know, there's- And we put it in our DeLorean as we go back to the- t- like. <laughs> Well, Dude, I would totally the put the DeLorean right now, man. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. Uh, yeah, you know, or, or another example is like, ah, well, you know, I don't want to pay for that because my supply rep provides me a deck of, uh, it does a reads off of a presentation for my OSHA training for free. And I'm like, yeah, but they're doing that to sell you more supplies, not to really manage risk. And they're yeah. just like, ah, it's easier to do it. And I'm, so the, the, the general thing, it seems to be, and I get it, people are busy that the path the easiest path, what's minimum necessary standard seems to be ruling the world with dentistry. Not, not in total, but um, it comes down to like facilities, you know, or mm. when you build a new facility, there seems to be a, a, an interest in, well, what's the most minimally viable thing I can get by with to meet the rules for whatever. And uh, our doctor coming, Hey, Carrie, tell me all about compliance. I'll get all through it. And they're like, Oh man, this is way too much. I'm like, it's not extra, dude. It's part of it. It you have to do it, and so then uh, the that's the so, big objection. Is, is the so it's not even a matter of of no, I'm not going to do it. It's like okay, I know I got to do it. What's the minimum? And what's what's the least path to resistance I get to? Like that's interesting because I think as a, as even a human study, I think that's almost a common thing that many of us do. I know I do that in certain things like, okay, I want to lose weight. What's the fastest way to do it? What, what's, <laughs> what's the thing that's going to inter- not interrupt my lifestyle the most, but like, how can I eat all the sugar I want or all the crap food I want? Right. Like, I think we do that often and I don't, uh, I, I can see what a risk that is for people because they're looking for the minimum. But the truth is, is that usually when the problem happens, it's not a minimum problem. So let's go there. Let's talk about that. So there's, when we look at malpractice lawsuits, uh, the first big number that jumps off the page, and this is off of a research report from one of the malpractice insurance carriers that looked at 5,000 closed malpractice cases. The big number that jumps off the page is 80% of all malpractice cases yield no payment to the patient. So that means that there are cases being filed that yield no payment, which means the doctor was successfully defended. So it was some sort of disagreement the patient had with the practice that yielded the lawsuit now, or the, the, they were clinically injured, right? There is some sort of clinical injury aspect to it. So mm-hmm. that's for sure there. But the, the, 
what happens is, is that we've, we've done, not done a good enough job of setting the expectations on the patient aspect. So there's a mis, mis expectation, which leads to this challenge. And I, I think when, when we look at like the, I bring that up specifically because when you, when you open your door in the morning to go to work as a dental entrepreneur or any entrepreneur, the, the issue of the day in your face is what you're going to address today. And if it's already been handled in some manner, you're like, eh, you know, I'm not going to sure. the, the It's like CPA. Like you wake up in the totally. morning, man, I do need a CPA. I need a new CPA because I'm not sure. And then the, the, you talk to CPAs like, well, I need 18 years of paperwork and where is all this? And it's a, you know, the, the data mine to get the switch is really heavy. And uh, so the people just defer. They're like, ah, I'm just going to move, move into the priorities for, <laughs> that's in my face. Wow. And it just happens. I think, uh, uh, you know, it, and I'm not holding people, like I'm not judging people because I kind of get it. But when, when, it, when something negative happens, then it's like everything else falls off, right? This, this injured patient, like we had a patient that um, the, 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 the husband came in and said, Hey, I'm here to pick up my wife. And he didn't know he was really going to have to pick her up and they lost track of her. They didn't know where she was. And they found her in the bathroom. She had fallen and broke her hip in the bathroom. Wow. Wow. And, uh, the practice had lost track of her and they just got too busy in the day to pay attention. And that led to a ton of money going out the door for wow. practice. And there's hundreds of the, I have hundreds of those stories where the, the process failed. And I just don't think people pay enough attention to the process and have that kind of discipline to keep those things from happening. Cause we're, you know, answering phones, moving people to the practice, treat, yeah. providing dentistry. And then uh, the day's over. We got to go home. Well, I hope what people really got out of even just that simple example of oh, somebody falling in your bathroom. I mean, how many people are really thinking, hmm, where is that person who came into my office? I thought they were here. We don't see me here. And, and, and you just lose track because you're day. Like that's a, a, such an interesting example because it's such an odd one. And I don't think we always think about the odd stuff. We think about the like, oh, if I screwed up or this thing messed up or, you know, patient slips on the water type thing. But we're not thinking about just the things that are just weird. And yeah, that's, those are low, that's a low, low frequency situation. But when you look at the malpractice lawsuits, it's how we react when the adversity occurs. Yes. Are we, are we prepared and adept and, and uh, graceful in that response that, then magnifies or demagnifies the impact to the patient at the end of the day or the impact to the practice, right? Um, so here's something that I, I don't know this. So I'm asking this uh, and I'm, I'm, I like to try to put myself in the position of the listener and what they'd be asking right now. But I bet I'm probably the only one listening to this who doesn't know this because I've never had to experience this. Knock on wood. I have a wood stool here. I'll knock on that. Um, <laughs> somebody gets sued in this situation, they get a malpractice uh, a claim against them. In this scenario where 80% where of the patient not getting a payout, the doctor is still having to pay out the defense of that, right? Through the attorneys and stuff like that. There's still a fee that the doctor is still going to pay just for defending themselves, correct? Because the insurance yeah, doesn't cover that. Yeah, the insurance covers that. The insurance actually finds you the attorney. Okay. Yeah, so the insurance companies don't have their own attorneys per se locally. So if you get into trouble, there's a contracted attorney firm that'll come defend that insurance company's customers. So and even more so of a reason to have that, to, it's having the, the insurance, having the risk management is actually building the team for when disaster happens, not not just something more that uh, not just something you're paying just to like for me, sometimes insurance can sound like, Hey, I'm paying insurance every single month. I, I haven't gotten in a car accident and I can't tell you how long again, we'll knock on some wood, but I'm paying it every month for just in case. Right. But when well, I do get yeah. in a car accident, it's not like there's going to be a team of people behind me. It's I got to go and now deal with more crap on my own. <laughs> in this case, it sounds like the risk management is really is such a great team builder for risking managing that risk well with insurance is just this this is all insurance is you're transferring risk to an insurance company in exchange for small monthly payments sure right? you're right. You, in malpractice land you're putting millions of dollars at risk on the line for the insurance company and they're going to charge you tens of hundreds of dollars a month or sure. that. 
Sure. And, and you're, you, that's all it is. You're not going to get new teeth from a malpractice policy. All you're going right. to get money. Right. So right. the, the, what, but what comes with patient injury is scrutiny oftentimes from the state board level. And then the state board will come in. Like we have a case of, out of El Paso where the young man was needle stuck and they didn't do what they needed to do to take care of him, the practice. And then he has subsequently got fired for performance. Well, then he turned around and filed uh, complaints with the mm. state board and with OSHA. And those two guys showed up together to the practice. So the state board guys going through all the files going, your paperwork is atrocious. So we're going to find mm. you for that. And then also there's 130 other items we need to check while we're here. And then the OSHA guys like, well, this is an OSHA violation. Here's a $7,000 penalty or whatever the penalty ended up being for her. She ended up having two OSHA violations in the same year. Ouch. And, um, not our customer, by the way. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, so the, the scrutiny when things go wrong and that's just the regulatory bodies. We're not talking about Yelp and Facebook and all the mm -hmm. micro evaluations you get uh, publicly that are out in the world because of the way you act as a practice or operate. And how you sure. People. So, um, it's a, a, like all of this, it's kind of a wandering conversation because it is rabbit holes everywhere. It certainly seems like it. Yeah. Cause I'm sitting here thinking about, you're talking about documentation. One of the things that I, uh, I, I, I speak about and I just wrote about in my last book about the fears of firing people the number one fear is they're going to sue me for wrongful termination. And my number one answer is, well, I'm assuming then you don't have all of the things you need documented for every time you spoke to them, every time there is an infraction. And I'm going to be nice and say 80% of the time. Like, I think I'm being nice. It's a uh, nope. I yeah. don't. We don't yeah. do regular things. We don't do that. It's like, geez, that's avoiding risk right there. That's yeah. covering your assets, right? So, you know, um, that's the that's the relationship with your with your employee. Yeah, like they they should be in a position to fire themselves because they know they're not a fit, and that because these conversations have occurred, this isn't a shocker. Right. Like they know they, but then for me, I'm hearing, okay, we need to fire somebody. And whenever I hear this, they always ask about employment practices, liability stuff yep. like this. I always ask, why did you hire them in the first place? Mm. Right? Because your hiring process, the, that, firing someone is a failure of your hiring process. Mm. That's yep. so cool, right? Yeah. And, and, and also your management level. Like, yep. you know, once they're in, you got to manage them and make sure they're performing. And there's a bit, then it gets complex. But up front, it's the hiring. And then, they, like I always say, they hire for skill and, and experience, but they fire for attitude and behaviors. It's like, okay, well, why aren't you recruiting for the attitudes and behaviors, right? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Dave Ramsey has a thing. Uh, I was listening to him probably, I think it was a year ago. It was talking about how he took all of his and he had, you know, 200 employees or whatever. And he takes them out to, gives them $1,000 to go and just spend at a mall, you know, type thing. All 200 of them. And he says, the thing about working for our company, though, is you have to go through 10 interviews just to be hired. He said, because the longer you allow people to talk, the more they will show you who they are. And so we take them through 10 interviews. So yeah, you're right. Like you're hiring based upon, why are you hiring on that attitude? And uh, with again, another rabbit hole. We could yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother interview thing. But so there's a, there's a sequence of things I think with respect to um, like, for example, our software platform Dundesk was yeah. designed to help you develop these systems uh, you can tap into our systems or you can develop your own. And when I say our systems, they're basically compliance training programs. Mm -hmm. but you can practice can, you can develop your own training courses and put this stuff in play. Nice. So you can create a more systematic way to keep this in your practice versus it being in a binder covered with dust back in the, back in the cabinet. And when they do it, it's, I'm assuming it's a, it's documented showing, Hey, you did it. So there's your compliance, right? So it's built in. It's not something you have to think to do. Yep. Every Friday, the employees receive a notice on documents that are expiring, things that have expired, and then all the training you haven't taken that we've assigned you. And those training nice. courses could be things like handbooks or could be how do we greet patients or how we set our ops up. Um, but it could also be com uh, compliance related, infection control, risk management, whatever it is. And, um, uh, the, and there's a, just a sequence of things that I think that would lift the doctor a, a bit more. That's why it exists. It's, it's just another tool that they can use to, to address these things. 
Oh, I think it's more than a tool. When you think about the bandwidth that would open up in somebody's brain of knowing it's being automatically taken care of them. I'm not saying that anything in your business should ever be a set it and forget it. I never have to worry about it because I have a system in place. But to, I guess we're going back to the beginning of, you know, managing that risk of not having that to having something like Dundas where they can just say, hey, okay, you got that email on Friday. Like They know you got the email. Did you guys check that off? I get a report saying they checked it off. I can go up there and see, yep, they watched it. That is huge bandwidth, you know, expander, which more and more things in business, as we talked about at the beginning, especially as an entrepreneur, they are bandwidth retractors. Yep. And this, this seems like it'd be a really great bet. How did you, uh, how long has Dundas been going on and why did you decide to start that? Uh, we started it because I was in 200 offices and I just kept seeing no one had it done. It was just the, the, the variance. So, so error occurs when variance occurs that mm. is contrary to your set standard, right? So you have a standard, we don't meet the standard and then something bad happens to the practice. And all of these standards, people call them systems, uh, you know, some guys call them fundamentals. I mean, there's these consultants that have the different names, but ultimately all of it, no matter what you call it, it's a process. We do this, then we do this, yep. then we do this. And the predictable yep. outcome should be this if we've given all these knowns. And when the knowns are there and presented to your employees and you tell them this is our standard, then their performance becomes variant we're watching for variants, right? We're, we're encouraging consistency and we're managing variants. Mm. Well, the, that's why I built Dundas because they're the people, the people that were uh, there, they were building risk into their business by hiring people and growing to multiple locations. And they were not addressing any of this. I'm like, dude, you're just working to pay penalties at the moment. This practice is, a, is on fire, but wow. we don't know it yet. Wow. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a guy here in Texas that owns like dozens and dozens of offices and he was at the state board talking to them about violations of fair dealing, which means bait and switch and some other like mm -hmm. billing related things. I'm like, this, this, is, this stuff should have been done they, like at your second office. Wow. Right? Why do you have all these offices? So there's the, that's, that's why Dundesk exists. And we've got um, coming on after this month, we'll have almost 300 different practice groups using it. Uh, using the software. We've got tens of thousands of employees in the system um, wow. and, uh, and we're loading in new, we're actually launching this month. We're doing a monthly risk management conference where you actually get CE uh, by just listening to the podcast and it's going to be things like emergency preparedness, all this stuff we've talked about. It'll be sure. every month to give them more of a consistent flavor and feel and, and they can take it and say, Hey guys, we need to pay attention to this as part of our overall burden. You were mentioning earlier, um, I think you had mentioned, you can actually, as a, if I had Dundesk in my office, mm -hmm. I can actually upload my own training as, as well. It's not just the Dundesk trainings, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, so let's say you have a phone. You have a yeah. cell phone with a camera. You're going you, where I was going, man. Yeah, you could stand right in front of the patient. It even, we even have doctors doing employee training in the mouth yes. with a yes. cell phone and say, okay, as a dentist, and I'm working on this patient as an assistant. These are the things I need you to get at these stages of the yep. treatment. And they're, they're filming the mouth and they're filming the tray and they're going back and forth and then they save it. And in minutes, it can be delivered to all of your people. I love it. I'm a huge fan. I love that you said it because I'm a huge fan. I, all my clients, I'm like, dude, it, like your phone, I'm holding up my phone for people who are listening. It has an amazing camera on it. Uh, you can whip it out right there. You can do everything from, I had a doctor who uh, had their, um, their chair side, you know, the, the drawers that they put everything in, all the equipment and how it goes in. And he had a color coded chart and it was written out and uh, telling people what it needed to go in there. And he said, but the problem is people still aren't doing it the way that it is supposed to be done, how I like to have it done, even though it's color coded, even though it's charted out. So I said, dude, open up your phone, take a video and show them exactly what you want. Give them another way to learn this and upload it. And in my case, I didn't know about Dundesk at, this, at that time. And I had said, hey, just put it on a folder on your computer. And so when somebody needs to learn it, you say, hey, go watch that video again. This is a great example. I'm excited about it because it's a great example of, of solving a major problem. We were at that, uh, that conference in Dallas a couple, several months ago, and uh, Dr. Fishbein out of Florida uh -huh. had yep. this program on Fishbein Fundamentals. And yeah. the entire time, him the and his friend of the show, yeah. They're talking about 
you know, the, the, the fundamentals, I said, mm. all of these are training courses, not, they're not, real yep. training, but, but I mean, these could be in Dundesk for any customer yep. and they just know how do we greet patients? How do we do pre-treatment planning? How do we uh, do X, Y, or Z? All of that can be in there. And, and there's a way to download checklists with it. We have almost 400 practice management documents in the software. Wow. So, uh, things like uh, job posting templates and you name it, emergency preparedness stuff. I mean, all kinds of documents that people just ask me for on the weekends. I'm like, geez, I got to find that document again. I'm like, hey, yeah. I'm going gonna, gonna to go spend a bunch of money and make a software that has all this for it. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that. I, no, you're uh, I, 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 the team. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's amazing. <laughs> Well, man, we could literally talk about this all day long. I love this stuff. I love the uh, the practicality of being able to uh, just take the. It sounds so cliche, but just minimize that risk. Like take it away, and I believe that when people aren't having to worry about stuff like this, even that it's not running down in the back of the subconscious. I know the doctors aren't walking around every single. Well, most doctors, hopefully, aren't walking around worried about the risk. But when it pops up, it's it's. Uh, it's top of mind all the time. It affects your relationships with your family. It really it affects your uh, your creativity, your ability to be the best you can be. And so to have this as something where they're not having to worry about it anymore, and it can free them up. It's freedom. That's what it is. That's the word I'm looking for. It's freedom. Yeah, freedom. It's the opposite and peace of, of soul crushing. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you so much for all of your wisdom. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Ah, it's just easy. It's carry at dentistsecure.com. We got dentistsecure.com. We got lots of cell phones and phone numbers and emails. We're not hard to find. We're on Facebook and LinkedIn and all that. So it's a, a couple of things we mentioned with dentistsecure.com and uh, dundesk.com are two of our websites we can we can have. And uh, yeah, we, we can pass our cell phone numbers around through the, pod, through the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put that on the um, on the show notes as well. Uh, any links to that? Because we want to make sure that people get a hold of that. Um, I'm going to run through my rapid fire questions with you really fast. Uh, what happens is I just ask if, uh, six questions and then you just give us your shortest and fastest answer possible to wrap everything up. Sound good? Let's go. All right. What's the most expensive thing that you feel practice owners are missing in their practice? Uh, a good manager. Oh, nice. Good manager. What's a book that you believe every practice owner should read? Oh, that's easy. It's called From Impossible to Inevitable. By whom? Uh, Aaron Ross. Nice. I haven't heard of that before. I will put that in the the show notes. It's a book about uh, how to develop a software company, but it speaks to division of labor and specificity in what we do so we can accomplish what we do without uh, getting bogged down and trying to do everything. I love books from other industries that I can just totally take that information and just yeah, easy read. It's like we're talking about the very beginning too. So yep. love it. I, easy every, read. Easy every read. entrepreneur has the same problem. Uh, as you talk to these practice owners and stuff, you know, I'm a big, huge fan of culture and team performance as being the foundation for business growth. What do you see as the biggest challenge that private practice owners are facing with their teams and their office culture? Having the right team in the first place. Building the superstar team. I totally yeah, agree. Hundred percent. Right people. If you don't 100%. have the right people, whatever you do is not going to achieve its success. Yep. Totally true. So, big question. I know, but off top of your head, what's the best advice that you've ever received in business or in life? Ah, <laughs> that's easy, man. I say this every morning when I'm looking in the mirror. It's kick your own ass. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like yeah. quote uh, hash, hashtag anybody know? It's it's kick your kick your own ass by Jeff Gittimer. It's probably one of the first YouTube videos out there. He's a sales guy, and it's basically like don't worry about what everybody else is doing because the the person that you are up against that impacts your life the most day to day. So true. So true. That kick guy in the mirror. Ass. Every morning. Love it. Wow. That's a good, I I got I, I need to think of that more often. That's awesome. All right. The best resource or tool that every private practice owner should be using to grow their practice, not just Dundesk. Not just Dundesk. Yeah. Uh, best resource tool anyone could use to grow their, to grow their practice. Right. Not just right. where it is. Right. Uh, I think that uh, yeah, EOS stuff that's uh gino wickman that yeah know, attraction entrepreneur system that uh that's another good book uh, uh again yep. just having specificity in what you're trying to do is your business that's a, that's a good tool i think that'd be good that is actually really great advice for those of you that don't know that book traction uh but i, I actually got i'm in a mastermind with gino and he's an amazing guy 
uh, everybody should be reading that book. It's great. And, and obviously we think a lot alike, so it's great. Um, Lan, I, I can't tell you how much I so appreciate your time and your wisdom here on the show today, Carrie. We went a, long, a little longer than usual, but I know my editor is going to have a field day with some of the stuff that we talked about. Yeah. I love it. And nice. I really appreciate it. You know, I think it's one of those things that uh, people only think about when they need it. And I think they need to be thinking about it more often because uh, then it just gives that peace of mind. So thank you so much for being a part of the show. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, this is not the last conversation I think we're going to have on this. hundred percent. We'll definitely have to have you back too, again, for a part two, because I'm sure our, our listeners will love that. And speaking of our listeners, I just want to thank everybody out there for listening to the show and being a part of uh, what we do, because it really is all about you, about helping you have the best practices in your business. Thank you so much for watching this show. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.